What's up my pre-calc people? This is Michael Princhak, ready to talk to you about topic 1.7 from AP Pre-Calculus. In this topic, we're gonna teach you about rational functions and how to analyze the end behavior of rational functions. It's a pretty simple process with very limited math, but it's all about understanding the concepts of what happens when you do that very little bit of math. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. First, what is a rational function? A rational function is a function that can be expressed as a polynomial divided by another polynomial. So we have a function in the numerator, here I'm calling it n of x, we could call it whatever you want, f of x, g of x, h of x, doesn't really matter. And the denominator, we have another polynomial, d of x. Now there is a couple of rules here. First, the numerator can be anything it wants. Literally, there's no restriction on what the numerator can be. But the denominator got a couple rules. Rule number one, the denominator cannot equal zero. If your entire denominator is zero, well, then you don't really have anything because that just doesn't even exist. The second rule is to be a rational function, the degree of the denominator must be at least one. So basically, the denominator cannot be just a constant like two or three or five halves. It has to be something that contains an x to the first or an x to the second or an x to the third. Again, the degree of the denominator just simply has to be one or greater. Those are the rules. If you're that, you are a rational function. So here is our first example of what a rational function actually looks like. Pretty simple. We see a polynomial in the numerator that has a degree of four. We see a polynomial in the denominator that has a degree of two. And well, that's it. Pretty simple. Now, sometimes a rational function can kind of look like this, where it actually doesn't look like a single fraction, it's a combination of two, in this case 7x minus 3x plus two divided by 4x plus one. Now, this is great, this is a rational function, we clearly see that in the denominator we do have a, at least a degree of one, it actually is a degree of one here, but hold on a minute. If we're going to do all the analysis that's going to be needed in this topic and in later topics dealing with rational functions, we need one fraction, just one. One numerator, one denominator. Here we have like two. We got like the 7x over one, which is its own little thing. Then we have minus another little rational function. So we need to make this one, which is pretty simple math, but it's math that some kids overlook and forget how to do. So basically we're combining these fractions together. We're going to get a common denominator. We're going to adjust our numerators properly, as you see here, to get one single fraction. One numerator, one denominator, that's what's going to take for all the analysis that has to be done in this topic. Now, we actually, for this topic, dealing with end behavior, we want to actually leave it in standard form, where the numerator's in standard form, the denominator's in standard form, it's not factored. For what we're gonna do next in topics 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, factored form is actually preferable for more analysis, but for the analysis of the end behavior, we want it to be left in standard form. All right, so how do we exactly analyze the end behavior of a rational function? Well, first we gotta remind you what end behavior is all about. End behavior is analyzing what the outputs of the function are doing for input values large in magnitude, either positive or negative. Remember, looking at the end behavior is not just looking at what happens when x is three or five or 10 or 20. We're talking about numbers that are large in magnitude, like x being 100, 200, 500, 5,000, 10,000, 1 million. And in that case, what we're talking about is the limits, right? The limit of our function as x goes towards positive infinity. Those are numbers that are positive in magnitude and very large. And then we see the limit as x goes towards negative infinity, that is numbers way to the left in high magnitude but towards the negatives. So when we analyze the end behavior of a rational function, or actually any function for that matter, this is what we're looking at. Now when it comes to analyzing the end behavior of rational functions, we really want to focus on the leading terms, the leading terms of the numerator and the leading terms of the denominator. Because when it comes to rational functions for large magnitude input values, the function is dominated by the values of the leading terms. Hence the end behavior can be analyzed by assessing the quotient of the leading terms. Now, when you assess the quotient of the leading terms, three possible things can happen. So, to keep it nice and short, to find the end behavior of a very rational function, the very first thing you have to do is divide your leading terms. Take the leading term of the numerator divided by the leading term of the denominator. Now, again, three things can happen, and those three things are gonna help you determine what the end behavior of that rational function are. So let's look at those three different scenarios. The first possible outcome when you take the leading term of the numerator and you divide it by the leading term of the denominator is that the resulting quotient is a polynomial function. Okay, in this scenario where the resulting 
value, the resulting quotient, is a polynomial function, that means that the end behavior of the rational function will mirror the end behavior of that polynomial function. And here is an example of exactly that. So we have this polynomial function. And what we're going to first do is take the leading term of the numerator, negative 5x to the fourth, divided by the leading term of the denominator, 2x squared. Now, what do we get when we divide that? Well, we get negative 5x squared divided by 2. That is a polynomial function. Because remember, a rational function, the denominator at the very least has to have an x to the first in it. So since my denominator doesn't have any x's in it, then this is a polynomial function. And the idea is simple. The end behavior of my rational function will mirror the end behavior of this polynomial function. And I really hope you remember from a previous topic how to find the end behavior of a polynomial function. So this is an even degree. Degree is 2. 2 is even. That means both ends are doing the same thing, either both up or both down. But since the leading coefficient is negative 5 halves, that means both ends are going down. So the end behavior to the left is negative infinity, and the end behavior to the right is negative infinity as well. Here is a second example where we see this same different scenario play out. We have a polynomial function with a leading term, 3x squared in the numerator, and a leading term of just x in the denominator. We divide those leading terms to just get 3x. Okay, so the idea is when you get a polynomial function for that quotient, the end behavior of the rational function mirrors the end behavior of that polynomial function, in this case 3x. Now, that's an odd degree x to the first, odd degree, with a positive leading coefficient. So that means that the right end behavior is going towards positive infinity, and the left end behavior is going towards negative infinity. Now, an extra special note here. In this scenario, where the result of the leading terms being divided is a polynomial function, you do not, and I repeat, you do not have a horizontal asymptote. There's no horizontal asymptote. But there can be what we call a slant or an oblique asymptote. Everybody knows a vertical asymptote. Everybody knows a horizontal asymptote. A slanted asymptote is exactly like that. It's an asymptote that's slanted, also called an oblique asymptote. Now, this type of asymptote, a slant asymptote, will occur if that polynomial that you get from dividing the leading terms is linear. Again, if it's linear, you have a slant asymptote. And on top of that, the slope, or okay, let me say it this way, that slant asymptote that you have is parallel to that polynomial, that linear polynomial that you got. Okay, so let me step back for a second and explain this. If you divide your leading terms and you get a linear polynomial, okay, you're going to determine the end behavior the same way we just talked about. But on top of that, you automatically know you have one of these slant asymptotes, and your slant asymptote will be parallel, same slope, to that linear polynomial. So in that first example we saw, after our dividing the leading terms, we had negative 5x squared divided by 2. That's not linear. So this function, rational function, has no horizontal asymptotes, and it has no slant asymptotes. But in that second example we did, when we divided our leading terms, we got a polynomial 3x. 3x is, well, linear. So our end behavior doesn't change from what I taught you already, but this gives us some extra information that our function does have a slant asymptote, and that slant asymptote is going to be parallel to 3x, which means it has a slope of 3 as well. Now, what about the y-intercept? Well, we'll learn that in a couple topics in a future video, but there is still going to be a y-intercept on that slant asymptote, but we'll figure that out later. But what we know is that it's parallel to that given polynomial, which means they have the exact same slope. Okay, so the second scenario that occur when you divide your leading terms of a rational function is that you get just a constant. Like you divide and the x's all cancel out or the x is all reduced to a 1 and you simply just get a number. 1, 5, negative 3, regardless, you get a constant. No x's whatsoever. This means two things. First, this is telling you that you have a horizontal asymptote at that value b. So if you divide your leading terms and you get a constant, just generically I'll call it b, then that means you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals b. And when you have a horizontal asymptote, the end behavior to the left and the right is that horizontal asymptote value of b. So the limit as x goes towards negative infinity is b, and the limit as x goes towards positive infinity is b. Horizontal asymptotes act like vacuums. Towards the ends, they suck the function in closer and closer to them. So the limit as you go to the left or the right is going to be that horizontal asymptote. Let's look at a couple examples. 
In this first example here, we took our leading term, 4x squared, divided by our other leading term, the denominator, 2x squared, and the x squareds both cancel out or reduce to a 1, and we get 4 divided by 2, or 2. So in this case, we got a constant, no x's whatsoever. This automatically tells us that we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2, and it makes our end behavior super easy. The limit as x goes towards negative infinity and the limit as x goes towards positive infinity are both 2. Nice and simple. Again, very little math. The only math you're doing is the dividing of the leading terms, but it's understanding what that result tells you. Here is another example. We have a leading term of negative 5x to the fourth, a leading term in the denominator of 2x to the fourth. We divide, our x's all go away, or they just turn into a 1, and we get negative 5 halves, a constant. Again, simple information is conveyed to us. We now have a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative 5 halves, and our limit to the left and the right, our end behavior to the left, our end behavior to the right, both are negative 5 halves. Nice and simple. The final scenario that could happen when you divide your two leading terms is that you get a rational function, which means that you end up with x's left over in the denominator, because that's what a rational function has to have. Remember, rational function, numerator can be anything it wants, but the denominator has got to have at least an x to the first in it. So if you divide your leading terms and you get an x left over in the denominator, then you have a rational function. Now this is actually also really easy because this simply tells you that you have an automatic horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And that means your limit to the left, your limit to the right is, well, both 0. Because if you have a horizontal asymptote, your limits to the left and to the right are going to go towards that horizontal asymptote. Now some kids might ask, well, why is that? Well, remember, your denominator cannot equal x cannot equal 0 in the denominator, right? The x in the denominator cannot equal 0. So if you end up with 0, you have, well, nothing. It's undefined. It's impossible. So that is why when you do have a rational function, meaning you have an x in your denominator, once you do that division, then you cannot be 0, which automatically creates a horizontal asymptote at 0, which affects your end behavior and turns it into 0, making it pretty simple. Let's look at a couple examples. In this example, we take the leading term of our numerator, 3x squared, divided by the leading term of our denominator, negative 2x to the fifth, and we get a result or a quotient of 3 over negative 2x to the third. So we have a rational function left. We have some x's left in our denominator. Again, instantly tells us two things, horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, and the end behavior to the left towards negative infinity and the right towards positive infinity are both 0. Could it be any easier? In this next example, we see something similar happening. Leading term of the numerator, x squared, divided by leading term of the denominator, 2x to the fourth, results in 1 over 2x squared, a rational function, instantly informing you that you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, and both end behaviors to the left and the right are again 0. Now watch out for a problem like this. This is a problem where the numerator and the denominator are in what we call factored form. Now for what we're going to be doing in the next couple topics, which there'll be more videos of, we actually love factored form. Factored form is very, very preferred. But not when it comes to end behavior. When it comes to end behavior, you want it to be in standard form. But remember, we only need the leading term. So you don't have to multiply the entire numerator and the entire denominator out. We just got to get those leading terms. So in the numerator, that's going to be x times 2x, which is 2x squared, times the other x, making a 2x to the third. In the denominator, we have x times 4x, which is going to be a 4x squared, times the other x is going to be a 4x cubed. So I don't have to multiply the whole thing out. I just got to get those leading terms. Numerator, 2x cubed. Denominator, 2x to the third. And when we divide them to determine our end behavior, the x's all cancel, which is super nice, and we get 2 fourths or 1 half. And again, that simply tells us that we have a horizontal asymptote at that constant value, y equals 1 half, and both end behaviors, the limit as x goes towards negative infinity, that's the left, and the limit as x goes towards positive infinity, the right, is going to be 1 half. Really pretty simple. But watch out when you're in factored form, you might have to do a little bit of multiplication first to get those leading terms. Now the last thing we need to be able to do is also recognize all of this happening in a graph. So here is a graph where we instantly see a vertical asymptote and a horizontal asymptote. Now, vertical asymptote is going to be on a topic later to come, but right now we're concerned about that horizontal asymptote, and we clearly see there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals 4. And remember, when you have a horizontal asymptote, that simply means that your end behaviors to the left and the right are going to approach that horizontal asymptote, so both end behaviors are 4. Really couldn't be any easier. Remember, those horizontal asymptotes like vacuums, they suck the function getting closer and closer to them. And here is a second graph where we notice a slant asymptote. Pretty cool, maybe you've never seen one before, but we see both a vertical and a slant asymptote. All right, so now, if we see that slant asymptote, remember, if we had the function, the rule is that, well, the uh, end behavior of the rational function is going to follow the end behavior of the polynomial. But I don't have the function, I just have a graph. But remember, here's the idea. 
Keep in mind, asymptotes, whether it be vertical, horizontal, or slant, they're going to suck the function towards it. So look at this right end, okay? The asymptote is going up, 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 forever and ever and ever. So the function that's going to get closer and closer to it is also going to go up, 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 forever and ever. So the limit as x goes towards positive infinity is positive infinity. Even though there's an asymptote there, the asymptote is going up forever. Well, so is the function. And then if we look at the left end behavior as x goes towards negative infinity, we notice that the asymptote to the left is going down forever. So the function is going to get sucked into it, going down forever. So the limit as x goes towards negative infinity is negative infinity as well. So not too bad when you do have a slant asymptote like we see here. And we do notice that the equation of the slant asymptote is y equals 1x plus 1, which is great. But right now, I just case you understand end behavior, which is looking at those ends. So even though there's a slant asymptote, the ends are still going towards infinity or negative infinity. All right, that's it for topic 1.7 of AP Precalculus, looking at the end behavior of rational functions. It's quite simple. All you have to do is make sure that you have a rational function in standard form, numerator, denominator, take the leading terms and divide them. And the result of that division is going to tell you exactly what to do. If you got a polynomial function, you have no horizontal, you might have a slant, and your end behavior is going to mirror the end behavior of that resulting polynomial function. If you divide your leading terms, you simply get a constant. Well, there it is. You have a horizontal asymptote at that constant, and your end behaviors to both sides are that constant. And if you get a rational function when you make that division, and your denominator has that x left over in it, then you're automatically going to have a horizontal asymptote at 0, and your end behavior both ways is going to be 0. Nice and simple, not too complicated. Just make sure you take your time to really understand the concepts of it. See you in the next video.